Much of the drama of Quantum Break is centered on the inevitability of fate. Paul mentions multiple times there is no point in trying to prevent the fate that awaits them, as we are all bound by time. Even those that are chronon enhanced and can manipulate time itself cannot alter events that have already occurred. In this universe, there is only one possible outcome based upon the collective choices we make. But as seen in Junctions, Paul is able to see the outcome of his actions and decide which branching path to go down. This posits the fact that multiple realities can exist based upon his choices. Paul's actions determine whether characters like Amy Ferrero or Charlie Wincott live or die. There are 16 possible branching universes within Quantum Break, and as the player, we can only ever experience one at any given time. But what if someone was disentangled from the fabric of time itself and could experience all of these potential realities simultaneously? Luckily, we can witness how such an individual functions as the entities that exist outside of time are present within the game. These would be shifters. While we physically see two shifters in the story and witness another being slowly created, not a lot of information is given about them. Before discussing examples of the ones we do know, let us take a look at what they are exactly. In one document, these entities are described as chronon disrupted wave functions and said to exist in a constant state of quantum superposition. Let's take the time now to define these terms. Chronon is a theoretical particle and energy field within the story that creates the basis for the linear flow of time. Any disruption of this field results in temporal distortions. This can be witnessed by the fracture in time or with those who are chronon active. These are people such as Jack and Paul who have been exposed to so much chronon radiation that they are able to manipulate the chronon field and by extension, time itself. A wave function is a mathematical model that describes the quantum state of a system. There are two examples relevant to the story. The first is a well-known thought experiment called Schrodinger's cat. The wave function for the cat is that it can be either alive or dead and constantly shifting between both states. Only by opening the box and observing the contents inside does the wave function collapse into a single reality. This can be witnessed with the shifter Martin Hatch's death. In the control choice, after witnessing Charlie's death, Liam Burke stabs Hatch in the left eye, killing him. In the surrender choice, Charlie survives, Liam is the one who is killed, and Emily Burke shoots Hatch in the right eye to kill him. Just like the cat, both potential realities are real, and it is only by making the decision at Paul's final junction that the wave function collapses and the game's reality is made. On a side note, I find it interesting that between Liam and Emily Burke, they both kill Hatch by inflicting fatal injury to a different eye. Between the two of them, both eyes of Hatch were destroyed. Another, lesser known example is shown in the double slit experiment that was originally performed in 1801 by Thomas Young. The intention of this experiment was to determine if light behaved as a wave or a particle. By shooting particles randomly at a panel with a single slit cut into it, the wave function can be either to hit the screen or pass through it. For those particles that pass through, it creates a vertical pattern on the wall behind it. This is what we expect if light behaved as a particle. Waves, however, behave differently. When a wave such as water or sound passes through a single slit, it creates a unique pattern where the band in the center is strongest and decreases in intensity as it moves outward. This is because the wave hits the wall strongest at the central point, and weaker as it spreads out. At this point, physicists placed a second slit into the panel and sent a wave through. When a wave passes through the two slits, it creates two waveforms that interact and bounce off one another. This would create a series of interference patterns on the rear wall, each of which have the same wave pattern with the central beam being the strongest and weakening as it spreads out. At this point, it was theorized that when shooting particles through two slits, it would create two vertical bands on the wall. However, upon firing the particles, it created an interference pattern on the wall as if they were waves. The physicists assumed that the particles were bouncing off one another and created a false reading, so they decided to fire them one at a time instead. By doing it this way, they knew that they would not bounce off one another. 
However, the same result occurred as the particles, even when fired one by one, behaved like waves. Confused at this point, they set up a measuring device in order to witness which slit the particles actually passed through to see what was going on. What they found was that upon setting up the measuring device, the results of their experiment were different. Rather than the interference pattern, only two vertical bands were on the wall now. For some reason, the simple act of observing the particles caused them to change the way they behave. The most common explanation for the seemingly contradictory results of this experiment is the Copenhagen interpretation. Earlier, we discussed the wave function of Schrodinger's cat and how the possibility of it being alive and dead exist at the same time. In the Copenhagen interpretation, the results of the double slit experiment are because that single particle of matter exists as a wave function of possibilities. The photon hit the panel, went through slit A, slit B, and exists in any number of infinite states simultaneously. As a result, even though only one particle was shot through at once, it ended up interfering with the other possible versions of itself. Upon hitting the rear wall, as Schrodinger pointed out, we were able to observe it and the wave function collapsed into a single possibility. So what does this all mean and how does it relate to shifters? The state when the photon exists as a wave function of potential is called quantum superposition. As the monarch physicists determined, shifters exist in a constant state of quantum superposition. They exist in all possible times and all possible realities all at once. This is more based upon a different explanation for the double slit experiment called the many worlds interpretation. It posits the idea that the wave function never collapses and each possibility for the particle exists in any number of parallel universes all at the same time. We as the observer are only able to perceive one of them however. Instead of the act of observation collapsing the wave function like in the Copenhagen interpretation, the actions of the observer create a split into one potential reality. As seen with Dr. Kim, existing as a chronon disrupted wave function has caused his body to be torn between every version of himself. He is being ripped apart and reassembled without end. Within stutters and the end of time, chronon particles do not exist. Because of this, shifters are able to collapse into a single potential version of themselves and breathe easy the pain of their existence gone as long as they remain there. This may be why Hatch actively worked to sabotage the efforts to repair the fracture, so that him and shifters like him can have a world of their own free of pain. The three shifters we witness in the story show three different states of what they are. After his exposure to chronon radiation, Paul developed chronon syndrome. Because his body was saturated with chronon particles, he gained the ability to manipulate time, but as his condition worsened, his body began to disentangle from this reality. Effectively, we all live in a stable state. Chronon syndrome, little by little, forces the individual into a state of superposition, resulting in becoming a shifter. Throughout the years, Dr. Amaral developed a treatment to help stabilize Paul, tethering him to a single potential. Over time, however, the treatments became less effective. Nothing could stop him from becoming a shifter. It could only be delayed. His ability to perceive potential futures at junction points and redirect the events of the game is due to his Cronon syndrome and having a foot in both realities. Due to his extreme exposure, Dr. Kim was forced into a state of superposition much faster than Paul and contained within a Monarch research lab. Stuck inside of a pod, his body is being torn apart, reassembled, and forced between realities constantly. As a result, he is in never-ending pain. This brings us to the most prolific shifter in the game, Martin Hatch. Unlike Paul, Hatch became a shifter a long time ago, and due to the respite found in stutters and the end of time, he has found a way to stabilize his quantum state. His eye drops are part of what helps facilitate this and allow him to exist in a single reality. Despite this, however, infinite versions of him are still within the multiverse and can cross into this reality at will. This is why, even though we see him killed by the Burks in two timelines, he still returns, as a version of him always exists out there, ready to take its place. 
It is theorized that the only way to kill a shifter for good is to forcibly collapse its wave function into a single possibility and then kill it. Otherwise, other versions of it will always be out there, even if one is killed. In the end, shifters are individuals who exist across all times and timelines in a constant state of quantum superposition. This is due to an acute exposure to chronon radiation and the sickness that comes from it, characterized by the steady disentanglement from the chronon field that acts as the fabric of time. Hatch mentions there are other shifters, some of which we already know, some we don't. If Quantum Break does get a sequel, I am intrigued to see where they go with these chronon disrupted life forms. Since we are bound by time, we will have to wait and find out.